in kind of strange position he now finds himself um, as you know kind of holding the potentially the keys to sorting out Brexit. Well, in a sense, I've given him my advice. I think he should demand no deal. He should demand the long extension that we all know is needed. And he should demand that there is the opportunity for a confirmatory vote. You know, I, I, demand to rule out no deal. Yeah. 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 Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Gus. <laughs> Always been a very good advisor. <laughs> uh, yes, that is exactly what I meant. I'll say it again, just for the avoidance of doubt. Um, he should demand that we rule out no deal, mm. that we have a long enough extension, which is, has to be a long, really long extension to do what's required, and also that the people are given the opportunity of a confirmatory vote. I heard Stephen Barclay on the radio this morning say, oh, the government isn't setting any preconditions, except that, of course, the Prime Minister doesn't want the people to have a confirmatory vote. Mm. It's a rich irony, as Stephen mm. has just said. We've had umpteen votes in the House of Commons, and we're going to have more. The, the government has clearly been toying with the idea of a second election, only two years after we had the previous one. But the one thing you can't possibly have, according to Mrs May, is a return to the people to see if to conf they confirm that this is what they are prepared to accept. Even if it wasn't what they meant in 2016, is it what they mean now? That's just ludicrous, and it is completely undemocratic. I, I think it's really important um, that he shows uh, very strong leadership and charts a way forward uh, that is clear and deliverable. One of the real problems, uh, and I think Stephen touched on it, has been the sense of denial uh, about things. So we come right up to the wire before uh, there's an acceptance that an extension is needed. Uh, and we need to have a very honest uh, conversation with the public and level with them about what is realistically possible. That's the real uh, issue for me. And I hope that Jeremy Corbyn, as well as doing the three things that Margaret has said, uh, says to the Prime Minister, let's have honesty here about the way forward and chart a clear and agreed path as to how we're going to resolve the issues. <coughs> Right at the back, I can see a hand, but I can't see who it's attached to. <laughs> hey, this way. Uh, no, right at the back. Was a hand there, wasn't it? If not, then take the one that you can see there. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Shrey Kisan. I'm from Huddersfield in West Yorkshire, and just a common man. Um, <laughs> I believe that the people's vote must include enthusiastic support for the European elections. Uh, because till now we have been represented, to put it politely, by plonkers like Nigel Farage uh, in, in European Union, and we need to have relationship with Europe. And we must do everything to put people who are much more decent compared to Nigel Farage in the European Union, if for nothing else but to develop a good future relationship with the European nations, who I think are incredibly helpful uh, and still tolerating our idiotic process that has been going on for the last so many years in here in our country. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Farage's position is interesting. As I recall, before the referendum outcome was known, he said that if it was close but uh, he lost, he would demand another uh, vote for the people. Um, and I read the other day, um, I don't know how, I hope I'm not being inaccurate, um, that he had said that if Brexit turns out to be a disaster, he'll go and live somewhere else. Can I just add one thing? It, it's, it's really important, uh, given that I, I think we almost certainly will have these European elections now, that we get the turnout up. I mean, in the past, mm. these have been yeah, very bad. Yeah, yeah. Can I just say, what I really look forward to is having a vote, because Bob and I are in this wonderful position, along with <laughs> criminals and uh, yes. uh, others, that we're not allowed to vote in general elections. So this is an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can also stand, of course. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going far too far. <laughs> uh, yes, there's a... Um, could I have your comments on why it seems in the process of indicative voting over the last few weeks there seems to have been very little role for the House of Lords, who in the earlier stages of the process were an important voice, um, a more diverse voice, 
Um, and can you say how the House of Lords might possibly re-enter the public arena on this? So I kick off. So um, we are a, revi a revising chamber. That's the nature of our constitutional structure. Uh, and therefore, uh, this part of the proceedings is very much for the Commons, the elected chamber. Uh, there is still an important role for the Lords, I stress, in that uh, when it comes to, Margaret referred to, a lot of legislation, people have underestimated the amount there is still to be done there. And the Lords will play its full part. Remember the Lords, uh, I'm, uh, I was shy but, but happy to vote against the government frequently during this Brexit process already uh, in order to ensure there were votes in the Commons and that the, this the opportunity existed for this debate to happen, which might not otherwise have, have done. So I think we will play a very important role. And I should stress, a lot of people concentrate on this deal, which, which is important, but it's a relatively small part of the overall aspect of us leaving. Next comes the really big stuff, the UK-EU trading relationship. Uh, once we're into the detail of that, if indeed we are down this route, then there will be another big and important role for the Lords to play in its role as a revising chamber. Uh, I think you're right to say that the Lords have been essentially bystanders for the recent uh, events. I think rightly so, because uh, the Commons is the democratically elected uh, chamber and it should be taking these key decisions on direction. But we will play a key role uh, when and if the legislation ever gets to us. I mean, we have been waiting for it. I call it waiting for Brexit, really. That's, the, that's what's going on at the moment. Um, uh, and we will then play a critical role in looking at the detail of the legislation. And as Gus says, uh, if the, we do go ahead on anything like the current deal, the work then starts. We're miles away from achieving closure through this deal to the Brexit uh, process. I would invite you to look at some of the debates that have gone on though in the Lords and there have been some remarkably fine speeches across all parts of the House actually on, on the issue of Brexit which I think have articulated uh, very well some of the challenges we now face. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Rosemary Radcliffe. Um, can I echo what an earlier questioner said? Um, this has been a really first-class set of presentations. It, it's put in, into the record what I think everybody in this room believes. So thank you very much. It's been excellent. Thank you. My question really um, relates to the views of our colleagues um, across the channel in the European Union. Um, I totally agree that we need a longer period. Um, the person who's going to be going and asking for it is a discredited Prime Minister. Do you think there's any risk um, given that it has to be unanimous, there is any risk that uh, some of our uh, colleagues are going to find difficulty in giving us the time we clearly need in order to sort this dreadful model out. There's talk in the press that maybe the French are less enthusiastic and so on. Um, that's absolutely fundamental. And is there anything we can do before she goes um, to make it clear to our colleagues that um, a very significant proportion of the British people simply don't agree I want to continue um, with the sort of relationship we've had in the past. Mm. I think this is a seriously worrying time mm. and it really needs yeah. people to do everything they can think of to make sure we get that long extension which we had to have. Mm. Mm. There is unquestionably that risk. Um, and mm. as, as it happens, I, I mean, I'm sure they're <coughs> heart, as, even more heartily sick of all of this than we are. Um, but on the other hand, very many uh, who are involved uh, uh, in the European Union have been following the twists and turns of the debate here, and I'm sure will be familiar um, with, uh, with this dilemma. Uh, it may influence them in, in what they offer the British government. Um, uh, who knows? Does anyone else want to join in on this? I, I, I suggested um, before the last European Council, I did one of those things I do about once every six months, which was to tweet. And I said if I were the EU, I would have uh, imposed two conditions. One was um, that you get a short extension if you get the deal through Parliament, and the second was, if not, you have a long extension. That seemed to me completely sensible, because that will allow all the different options. It's clear then there's no short-term answer, there's no deal going through, therefore you need a long time to sort everything out, for all the reasons that everyone on the panel has said. So I, I still stick by that, and I think the EU, there is still 
from my memory of all those European councils, and boy, were there a lot. Um, <laughs> They, there's still a lot of goodwill towards the UK, and um, I think, you know, it is difficult, I mean, to get 27 unanimous, remember it has to be unanimous on Article 50, um, that'll be difficult, but I think they will, uh, in the spirit of wanting to have a good relationship with us, I think they will support us, uh, so I just hope we ask, and you said, what, what can be done? Well, I think basically a million people made it pretty clear that the feelings here were very strong. So I think um, that just needs to be continued. Uh, you go first. Yeah. 